let's return to This Week in America. Here's your host, Rick Bratton. Welcome back, everybody. Coast to Coast, This Week in America, 1988 to 1990. These are the two years Dr. Florence Rosiello led an AIDS therapy group at Gay Men's Health Crisis in New York City. Eight Fought to Live, the story of my AIDS therapy group by Dr. Rosiello, is the story of eight gay men living with advanced AIDS and one inexperienced, fresh out of training psychoanalyst. Set against the backdrop of the late 1980s and early 1990s, a period marked by escalating AIDS statistics and widespread fear. Dr. Rosiello, Ph.D., opened a private practice in New York City in 1988. In 2000, relocated her private practice to Sedona, Arizona. Her first book, Deepening Intimacy in Psychotherapy, was published in 2000. Dr. Rosie Ello is the founder of the Arizona Society for Psychoanalytic Psychology and Arizona Psychoanalytic Society in Phoenix. She's a graduate of Columbia University, New York University, and Fordham University. Florence Rosiello, author of Eight Fought to Live, the story of my AIDS therapy group, 1988 to 1990, is our guest on This Week in America. Doctor, welcome to the program. A pleasure to have you with us. Thank you so much for asking me. I appreciate it. Really looking forward to uh, the conversation. This was such a dark period in history for so many people. You were at the, uh, the front lines of this, and it took 30 years to write this book, Eight Fought to Live, the story of my AIDS therapy group, 1988 through 1990. Talk about mm-hmm. why it took so long and why now was the time you wanted to write this. Well, some people said to me, Um, how did you remember something from 30 years ago? I said, well, I didn't have time to forget because I've been writing it for 30 years. But what would happen is I would write a chapter and I'd start crying and then close the computer and then I would think, okay, I'm not writing anything. And I would pretend I wasn't. And then someone would say to me, well, how's the book going? Good, I'd sit down again and write another chapter. It took forever, and of course, you know, after you write it, you have to rewrite it a couple more times. Yes. But um, it was it was excruciating a lot of the time. It had to be, and we'll talk about the emotional toll it took on you as you were dealing with these eight men and what they were battling. The name of the book is Eight Fought to Live, the story of my AIDS therapy group, 1988 through 1990, by Florence Rosiello, Ph.D., I'm going to spell that Rosiello as R-O-S-I-E-L-L-O. That's important. That's her website. And we've got all these links on our website. You can get information and order the book there as well. Why did you decide to lead an AIDS therapy group? How did that come about? This was, I understand, your first solo therapy. How did this happen? I was very naive. (laughs) (laughs) I would say I was just out of training um, in my late 30s. And it was interesting because they were all in their 30s, early 40s. One fellow was in his 20s. But um, why? how was it for me? Awful a lot of the time. But, you know, in the first year, no one died. And and actually, in the book, it doesn't really become sad until the very end, yes. the last chapters. The problem is, is that why I was crying when I was writing it was that I kept remembering who they were. And that was upsetting. It was just, I guess it was morning there. So I was very naive. I went in, decided I wanted to lead the group solo, which is not the policy of a gay men's health crisis where I led the group. And for the first year, it was fine. I think we all kind of fell in love with each other, or at least I did with them. And um, then about January, the 2000, no, I'm sorry, 1990, everything started turning around and um, one by one they started slipping away. Most of them I didn't see uh, pass away. They would be home, uh, they'd be in the hospital, so I, I wasn't able to see them. But as they started slipping away, I think I probably did too, because I really, I'm, I'm having my practice at the same time. So I'm working all day and then going down to GMHC at night once a week. Yes. And 
I was exhausted, really. And I wanted to quit um, around, I think it was January or February, to the point where I, it almost felt like I didn't know where my body was, which is at that time I, I fell and of course broke a foot. So when I got back to the gay men's health crisis, that uh, next group, I was like one of them finally, but it was really taking a toll on me. And I, uh, I started crying one morning, went to my supervisor and said, yeah, I have to quit. She said, well, you can't quit. Well, you can't quit. And I'm still crying. I'm crying now for hours. And I'm, I'm looking at her and I said, you know, how come I'm not dehydrated? I've been crying for hours. Well, she said, doesn't matter. You can't quit. So I decided, all right, I wasn't going to quit. And in the meantime, as they started passing away, my mother also passed away from breast cancer. And she did a, She died in uh, April and the group was pretty much over early May. So I'm not really sure how I made it. But one thing that happened, I sure learned how to do this work quick. Oh, yes. Quick. And I also learned that I couldn't, I couldn't stand behind a theory. I couldn't hide behind one. I had to actually be very real. I do have a relational psychoanalytics um, theory that I use, but I had to be with the, what these fellows were. I had to be right there in that moment. Well, they you, didn't you, have any moments you, left. You talk about that, how important that emotional authenticity was, that it's one thing what you learned in the textbook now you have to go out in real life and adapt to that situation. What was that like realizing, okay, I really need to tap in emotionally. I need to be real with these eight men. Well, first off, they were mad at me. So I realized <laughs> I had to give more of myself. Yes. Um, I didn't want to sit in a room full of uh, eight men, uh, all of them mad at me. So I had to be on the same level that they were. And that was draining, but boy, it, it really taught me that that's the most important thing in treatment. The other thing I learned about, because toward the end, of course they cried and I was crying, was um, how important it was to know what tears meant, what theirs meant, mine meant, because um, it wasn't always just that they were sad. There were many, many different meanings to it. And I've kept that in mind throughout my work as well. The name of the book is Eight Fought to Live, the story of my AIDS therapy group, 1988 through 1990. Our guest is the author, Florence Rosiello. Her website is florencerosiello.com. Information on the website, you're going to link on and buy the book there as well. The book available, of course, at Amazon, all of the usual places Talk about the pledge that the eight men took, uh, defying <clears throat> logic, defying science, defying basically even hope during that era. But they took a pledge. Tell us about that. You're right. I mean, sometimes people would get the diagnosis and die within months. So I interviewed 11 men to be in the group. And a week later, the group was to start, and I got there, and the secretary told me, um, there's only eight men in your group, three died well, in a week. So when I got into the room, which was hard, because I remember my knees were banging, I was so anxious. I looked in the room, and there were 11 chairs, but only eight of them were filled. Uh, oh, which empty chair is mine? Yes. Number one. And so one of the fellows said, sit here. Um, and um, he said, I said, let's start the group. And he said, well, let's wait for the others. Well, they're not going to be coming. And he said, no one in this group dies. And it just felt silent. Nobody said yes, nobody said no, but everybody started moving around in the chair as though the movement was, okay, we will all die. And they reiterated that. Matter of fact, at one point, one of the fellows was in the hospital and they went to visit him as a group. And 
as they were leaving, one of the fellows said to the fellow who was in the hospital, he actually screamed at him and said, I'm not ready for you to die. And a week later, the fellow came into the group. He just listened. He wasn't going to die. Yes. He did, of course. But they believed that they were going to help each other get through this. The thing is, you know, it wasn't that much longer after. I mean, they were gone by 1990, all of them. It wasn't that much long after they had medication. So they had they only been able to hang on a year or two more, they'd be alive now. Maybe around my age, I, I mentioned the backdrop for this. Let's talk about that period. Somebody younger going, boy, now AIDS is mentioned, but it's they don't fear AIDS like we did during that period. It was a, a dark period, a, a period of failure, of injustices. People were scared to death to go to funerals to go visit someone who had AIDS. Tell me a little bit about that backdrop, because it really was, a couple of years, a frightening time in American history. Well, originally, you know, they called it the gay disease. Yes. They didn't yes. that it was something that other people could get. Um, people wouldn't touch them. Um, you, you wouldn't kiss them. Um, people thought that you could get it just by, almost by being in the same room, which, of course, is ridiculous. And they felt like pariah. And then, you know, at times the, the, the chaos, the Carposi sarcoma, would start showing. And there were these lesions that were very purplish. And they, the men tried to hide them as best as they could. But that added to it because you see someone who looks like that, and it almost looks like they're a leper, I guess. And people just... They didn't even want to sit next to them. And I had oh, oh, maybe eight of my friends die before I started uh, the group. I think that was a big reason as to why I did. You know, the, one of my first friends who died, it was in 1980. This was really early on. Yes. They didn't even call it AIDS. They call it parasites. They didn't have a name for it yet. And so at 88, they... 1988, they did have a name for it, but they didn't have a cure for it. And people were dropping. I mean, you could lose a couple friends in a month. And one of the fellows in the group, Vito Russo, um, who was an activist and very famous, I don't know if people remember him now, which uh, breaks my heart. Um, one time in one of the group sessions, he opened up his little black address book. Remember, we all had all we, look, we all had that. We didn't have a phone back then. We carried it around, and he opened his address book up and showed it to us, so that we could see it. Every single name, all of his friends were scratched out. They turned the page, then they were all scratched out, all the names. And I kept thinking, like, I'm probably the only one in the room who has people that are still alive in my address book. And somebody said to him, uh, Vito, why do you carry that around? He said, well, I'm your friends. That's all I have. Yeah, yes. The only thing I've got left. He also did say, no one will attend my funeral. <sighs> They'll all be dead. It was such a sad time, and you... You were at risk there, too, emotionally, as well as going in with this group. How did you deal with with all of that? So many people, when they heard someone had AIDS, didn't want to be in the same building, let alone the same room. You are in there helping these people, literally holding their hands and helping them through this. And emotionally, this obviously took a toll on you as well. How did you cope with all the risk factors involved? Mm. Not well. Um, my marriage fell apart. So there were too many stresses on me um, from work, starting the practice, and from watching these men go. And um, at times, I don't know why I didn't <laughs> fall apart and end up in the hospital, but I didn't. I kept functioning. It was... I don't know, maybe it was just the thought of not having them that made me keep going back. Yes. And how could I think about myself when, when what they're going through? I mean, I, I did at times, 
but how could I really think about me when, oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm getting emotional now. Um, and fully understandable. You laid yourself out there to help these men get through this period, and you were a great consolation to them. And a tribute now, because as you're reading the book, Eight Fought to Live, uh, all the, the eight come alive. You feel like you know them when it's over. And as the doctor mentioned, it's not all tears. It's a story of hope. It's a story of uh, there's drama, there is sadness, there's surprisingly humor in the book as well. The book is available wherever books are sold. It's, a, uh, it's an excellent, powerful read. The guest, uh, the author, Dr. Florence Rosiello, her website is florencerosiello.com. And you can go uh, to our website, thisweekinamerica.us, link on, and uh, get all the information there as well. How did working with the AIDS group change your theoretical perspective? How did you change from a, uh, from a professional standpoint after going through and in, in working with these people and seeing what, what, what the group went through? How did it change? I think it changed more than just my theoretical perspective. I think it changed my life. Matter of fact, I put money on that to change oh, my yes, life. Yes. Um, I don't really know how I got through that, but that's an interesting question, but I'm not really sure how I got through it. Well, interesting. 30 years later, you're still sort of, uh, as you were writing the book, sort of going through this. And it's interesting. Did you have notes or did this, it, it sounds like this basically came from your memory when you decided to write this book, which would indicate, boy, these thoughts, they're still active in your mind, aren't they? You have no idea how active they are in my mind. Yes. I think about them every day. And actually, they took a group photo, and I have that on my desk all the time. So I get to look at them every day, all day. Um, I am getting emotional. Repeat your question again. Well, and I fully understand that. I'm, you will lay yourself out there, and you, you dealt with this group, and you got them all through this. What was it like? There's this pledge. Nobody is going to die and leave, leave this group, but, but they did. How did everybody regroup after all of you so close losing one? How difficult was that? And I guess that's a trite question because it had to be very difficult. How did you cope with that? It was, you know, they were used to it. They were used well, to people yes. dropping away. I mean, I wasn't, but they, they didn't fall apart. Um, I don't know what they did at home, but they didn't fall apart. Of course, most of them lost their lovers. Um, how did they get through How did I get through it? One of the things I've learned in life is that you just put your head down and keep trudging forward. And most of the time it works out, not all the time, but a lot of the time it works out if you just don't think about what it is you're really doing at that moment. Yes. Just keep right on going. And yes, I did write the book from memory, but I did start in 1990. I started writing the book in 1990. So I had my notes. Um, I couldn't get the notes actually from Gay Men's Health Crisis. They, I don't think they kept them in part because in 1988, we didn't have computers the same way we do now. I think we were still using DOS back then. And um, I couldn't get those. I did try and get the notes uh, from Vito Russo. They were in the uh, New York Public Library for 25 years. So I waited in a way to get those, but they really weren't decipherable. I couldn't understand because he, I think he was in the hospital and he was writing it. Um, I don't know how cognizant he was at that time. So. I'd like to ask, and I know this is very difficult, and I appreciate you you coming on and talking because this was such a uh, a very emotional part of your life. And how did you juggle that where you have Florence, who is the human being, who is in there with these people that you've grown close to, uh, showing empathy, working with them, trying to be their friend to get them through this, and at the same time, be the professional that's there to be sort of, I guess, the rock and to get them through all of this. 
What kind of juggling process was that to be the professional and to be the human being? I was just starting to be a professional. I probably was just starting to be a human being, too, <laughs> with the, <laughs> the kind of human being um, that I had been. And my whole life changed. I'm, my personality, um, what was important in life, I don't know how I got through it. I mean, I, you, you're asking that question. I, I don't really know how I, I obviously I haven't gotten through it because I'm still going through it yes um I don't really know I think I just kept plowing ahead and I think that's maybe the key there is just to plow ahead when times are difficult you you go forward you plow ahead and you have to feel when you look back on it I was maybe the right person to be in that group I was able to give comfort uh it was difficult for me emotionally but I really think I made their end of life better. I think I, I, I gave them the, the comfort that they needed. What kind of, of comfort do you get knowing that uh, you were there as a emotional support, getting these, these men through some very, very difficult times? You know, in writing it, and in writing down the words that some of these, from the sessions that they spoke, um, I gave them life. Yes. In a way that was hard to end the book because I didn't want, I didn't really want to stop. I thought, well, what does that mean to them? Like, the cover it closes. What does that mean? So I thought, I kept writing. I thought, this is their opportunity to be alive again, at least in the reader's mind. Yes. But in my mind, it's like every time someone reads it, it's like, oh, my goodness, my eight men are alive again. They're breathing. Well, you do bring them to life, and you take each one, and we feel like we know them as we're, we're reading the book, Eight Fought to Live. About a couple minutes left. Uh, looking back at that period, I mentioned before, there was so much, uh, so many problems, failures in the government, in the, the health care system. What lessons did we learn from this period and how we reacted and overreacted to the situation? I think it was almost akin to uh, COVID. Yes. Um, because actually, Dr. Fauci was the one who was um, doing the research on AIDS and yes. also on COVID. Um, I think it helped us to understand to not panic. I mean, I know in COVID we did panic um, in the beginning with um, with ACT when that was coming out. The problem was it came out too soon, and the problem was that the the trials, the tests, were not really very good. They were. They just weren't very good yes. because they realized that, oh, the, they could stop AIDS, the cells, with AZT. Okay, the AIDS cells. What they didn't know was they stopped all cells with AZT. So you were either going to die from AIDS or from AZT. And they realized, I guess probably around the 1990s, that it was killing them. So who knows what they really died of? Was it ACT or? And they couldn't get a hold of ACT too at the time they wanted oh, yes. it. But it was like, oh, good. I think probably ten thousand a pill, something like that. I'm, I'm not sure about that. But um, they went and marched on Washington. Um, they marched in front of the FDA. They tied themselves to the uh, stock exchange railings. Um, they tried to make this very public because people, as long as it was an a, a gay disease, people didn't care. Sad, but, just, but yeah, so true. It doesn't affect me. I'm going to protect myself and I'm going to be fine. And we sort of shifted it to the back burner. Unfortunately, we've, 
we've learned so much coming through that period and the book will take us back and it will humanize that 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 era the period that the doctor writes about 1990 and 1988 through 1990 and what she went through with these eight remarkable men and getting them through this this period the book is eight fought to live the story of my AIDS therapy group 1988 through 1990 by Dr. Florence Rosiello, that's R-O-S-I-E-L-L-O, florencerosiello.com is her website. We've got all this on This Week in America's website. You can click on, go directly to the doctor's website. Book available at uh, amazon.com, all the visual places. Thank EC Publishing LLC for arranging our conversation today. Doctor, the time has gone by way too quickly. I know it's it's still emotional. It, it's something that you, you carry with you. It's not like I close the door and I'm never going to think about that again. It's there, but such a powerful book that you've written and helping us all uh, get through that era and look at situations like this differently. Thank you so much for being with us on the program. Thank you so much for asking me and for um, helping me. The book is Eight Fought to Live, the story of my AIDS therapy group, 1988 through 1990, by Dr. Florence Rosiello, book available wherever books are sold. The doctor's website, florencerosiello.com. All that on our website, thisweekinamerica.us. You're listening to This Week in America, and we're back on today's program after these messages. This Week in America is online. You can visit our website, thisweekinamerica.us. Scott Pinkerton, associate producer of This Week in America. Jay Anderson, segment producer. Ben Watson, webmaster. Otto Bechet, director of engineering and TV production. This Week in America produced and is a trademark of Blue Funk Broadcasting, LLC. For information on all of our guests and to listen to this week's show, our website again at thisweekinamerica.us. And I'm Sean Bratton, executive producer of This Week in America.